Crazy liberal idea number one, Bush is a moron. One of the primary characteristics of Bush country, according to Bush's critics, is that he isn't up to the intellectual demands of the presidency. Or, to put it more bluntly, that he's a moron. This opinion has long offered perverse comfort to Bush's opponents. Reporters who traveled with him for months on his presidential campaign had taken to calling W. the English patient. Feel-good sites for Bush haters proliferate across the web, with names like PresidentMoron.com, BushIsAMoron.com, and TooStupidToBePresident.com. The hunger to believe in Bush's idiocy has led many on the left liberal side of the ledger into embarrassing missteps. One Bush critic, Joan Walsh of Salon.com, was dismayed to learn that the 17-year-old W's combined SAT score had been exactly the same as hers, 1,200 back when the SAT was actually difficult. In July 2001, reports Byron York, a fictional study purporting to show that George W. Bush had the lowest IQ of any recent president spread across the Internet. The fictional researchers determined that Bush's IQ was 91, precisely half that of Bill Clinton's 182, which was said to be the highest of recent presidents. The hoax should have been easy to spot. Nevertheless, the IQ story struck some of the president's critics as so believable that a few of them, including newspapers in Britain and Europe and Doonesbury cartoonist Gary Trudeau, reported it as fact, writes Byron York. In the wake of Bush's post-September 11th performance, the Washington writer Andrew Ferguson observed that the paradox of George W. Bush continues to puzzle the enlightened classes. The paradox, Ferguson continued, is simply this. How could the inarticulate bumbler of the 2000 campaign, a fellow so intellectually undistinguished, so clearly not one of us, prove to be such a deft and powerful leader? What disturbs Bush's critics most is that he does not act in accord with the reigning cultural affect of the American chattering classes, among whom I include myself. We pride ourselves on self-aware displays of cleverness, constant references to popular culture and the latest trends, and a hunger for sharing the trivia we know with others. To be sure, knowledge of popular culture is not enough. It's also important to drop the names of the novels we're reading and make clear we remain conversant with the works of philosophy and history through which we plowed in high school and college. We are drenched in irony. We don't like to take anything too seriously. This affect is what connotes intelligence to those who consider themselves the most intelligent people in America. It was very much the affect of Bill Clinton. Indeed, he may have typified the style. This is not Bush's affect, to put it mildly. Andrew Ferguson used New York Times reporter Frank Bruni's well-reported book on the Bush presidential campaign, Ambling into History, to explore what he called the paradox of George W. Bush. Ferguson pointed out that while Bruni tries very hard to be fair to Bush, and now I quote, the disdain is never far from the surface. Bruni dutifully cites instances of what he calls, with exquisite condescension, Bush's moderately active mind. Bush read and liked a detective novel Bruni recommended, for example. Evidence of excellent taste, clearly. Still, Bush's knowledge base is unacceptably spotty in Bruni's view. When someone mentioned the word vegan one day, Bush looked confused. He didn't know what that was. When somebody suggested he was a bit of a yenta, he flashed befuddlement. He didn't know what that was either. Bush had apparently never picked up a People magazine and never surfed the channels and rode the wave of Access Hollywood or Entertainment Tonight. It is actually offensive to the chattering classes that the president is not conversant with the kind of cultural trivia that fills our brains. It is somehow a strike against him in this group's eyes that Bush dares to be unaware of those who feed themselves within a particular substratum of vegetarianism, that he isn't up on garment center Yiddishisms, and that he should confuse Roger 007 more with Michael Stupid White Men more. Ferguson concludes, and I quote, The Bush paradox rests on a misapprehension one shared by American journalists and intellectuals, gazing down on their subject from Olympian heights. Reporters wonder why the gifts of the intellectual, for language and rumination and subtlety, aren't indispensable to the exercise of power, and indeed they aren't. Leadership requires will, self-confidence, and moral clarity, 
These Bush has in abundance. And the best bet is that he will continue to demonstrate them day by day, even as his intellectual superiors puzzle over their self-made paradigm.